Uh, so today um, is a, a chance to give you an update on where we're at on classification development. Um, some of you attended the, the three-hour workshop on Monday, uh, and I've unashamedly uh, used my team's uh, slides from that. Um, so uh, this is a much uh, quicker fly-through, a helicopter view, I guess. Uh, so why classification? Why is it so important? Um, it's one of the, the building blocks of an ABF system. We know that it's the one that answers the question that my patients are different and uh, that's all good, but this is different, my patients are special. Um, but it is one of the three uh, critical parts of ABF, uh, classification, counting and costing. Uh, IPA's role in classification development is um, defined in both the uh, NHRA, the original agreement, and also in the Act to uh, define uh, and um, specify classifications uh, for public hospital services. Uh, over the last 12 months, we've spent a lot of time uh, developing our classification principles uh, that we use when we're assessing changes to our classifications. Um, and so we've got our principles here, and as you read through those, you'll note that we don't, we can't satisfy all of them all the time. There's definitely a trade-off, um, often between the um, uh, the need to be administratively feasible uh, versus uh, the other ones. And you can see in some of our starting classifications that that feasibility is the one that uh, was a, a major issue and um, is why some of the classifications we've got are the ones we've got. So for admitted patients, we're using ARDRGs, of course, um, and ICD-10AM. Uh, currently on 8th edition and from 1 July this year, so next week, uh, we've priced services in ARDRG version 7. So that was released about 18 months ago and includes a number of improvements uh, since version 6X, uh, particularly around bariatric surgery, uh, paediatrics and neonates. And in terms of future development, uh, the National Centre for Classification and Health, NCCH, are leading the uh, consorti Consortium for Classification Development, the ACCD, so we've got Sydney Uni with uh, the University of Western Sydney and KPMG, and they're currently working on the development of uh, the ninth edition of ICD, uh, and also version eight of the DRGs. And um, they've divided the, the DRG project into two parts. Uh, the first is a major review of the complication and comorbidity system, or the CCs, uh, which is almost complete. And the second phase post that will be to, uh, to work on the, the DRG proper, uh, the splits between um, DRGs. So the CCs are really important. Uh, these are the, the measures that assign patients to different levels of complexity within an adjacent DRG. So this is what determines whether a patient is a, an A DRG, the most uh, complex, or a, a B or a C DRG in a, in a given adjacent DRG. And the initial analysis that uh, it, the consortium have carried out shows that there's considerable scope for improvement uh, in this. Um, and many of us have known this for some time. It, it's been a, a, a constant theme in a lot of uh, meetings in the, uh, in the development of the national pricing model. Whilst the DRGs are a fantastic system and um, you know, world class and we sell them internationally, it was recognised that there's room for uh, improvement and this isn't surprising, the, the complication and comorbidity list is, is quite old. It was developed right back in ARDRG version 4, uh, which uh, I understand was under ICD-9. So it's not at all surprising there's been significant changes in, in how things uh, are done in hospitals and the, uh, the complexity profiles of patients over that time. Uh, and the, the consortium have developed um, a very um, uh, robust uh, approach on the data available uh, that is quite different to how it's been done in the past. Um, and that's involved a lot of collaboration uh, with states and territories and other um, stakeholders through the, the technical group uh, and also clinicians through the clinical advisory group, which Amanda Ling chairs, she's here somewhere. Um, so that, that work we think is going to make a really big impact on uh, version 8 of the DRGs and will start to address a lot of uh, issues that are raised with us on a regular basis. Um, in terms of timeline on version 8, uh, so 
we expect that we'll have uh, an understanding of where the, the CC structure um, is going uh, in the next month or so, and uh, the work on the DRGs proper uh, will be finished by, by Christmas this year. Uh, ICD 10 AM, the ninth edition, is, uh, is progressing well as well. Uh, and they've reviewed a number of uh, coding standards and there's a, the usual updates to ACHI. Um, it's expected to um, uh, commence following uh, approval by IPA in late 2014, um, the, the release cycle, uh, and education should commence in, uh, in April 2015. Uh, so subacute and non-acute, um, so we use uh, two different ways to price uh, services uh, in the subacute uh, area. Uh, at the care type level, so where um, uh, ANSNAP data is not available, uh, we use a per diem approach, uh, so a, a single uh, rate for rehabilitation, one for palliative care, one for GEM, psychogeriatrics and maintenance. Uh, and we also price in ANSNAP version 3, which is our preferred approach. Uh, and we've signalled from 15-16, um, and you'll see in the consultation paper, again, that's just been released, that we are intending to um, cease pricing at the care type level from 15-16. So the only subacute pricing we'll do will be using uh, ANSNAP version 3. So the ANSNAP uh, clinical tools, so there's different assessments used uh, for each of the care types. So there's the FIM, uh, the HONOS, and uh, the RUG ADL. And this slide shows uh, which of the care types use which tools. Uh, hopefully there's no great news for people there, that's something that's well known. So IPA's engaged the University of Wollongong to develop ANSNAP uh, version four. The priority areas for development include uh, paediatrics, particularly in rehab and palliative care. And as you heard from Tony yesterday, that's challenging. There's, there's low numbers, but uh, the group are making good progress. Uh, and also in GEM, uh, uh, the feedback we got from GEM clinicians was that there needed to be more work uh, done on that uh, classification, that arm of the classification, uh, particularly to re better reflect uh, cognitive impairment. Uh, the work of uh, Wollongong Uni is supported by five clinical uh, subcommittees, so there's good clinical engagement, uh, and the da data is being sourced from a number of areas. Um, the, the activity data sets that IPA holds, the NHCDC, uh, and also the, uh, the costing study that we undertook last year, uh, which I've abbreviated to the non-admitted uh, costing study, of course it was not admitted and admitted subacute. So that was the data that I'm sure many of you participated in collecting. Uh, we collected over five, uh, 500,000 non-admitted um, service events and over 50,000 admitted subacute bed days. So we've got a really rich costed data source uh, that is informing this work as well. Uh, we need to collect additional data for GEM patients and that will take place uh, later this year. And the aim is to have uh, ASNAP version four ready for costing uh, pricing uh, for NEP 15, which gets released uh, early next year. So emergency care, you would know that we currently uh, use two different classification systems. We have the UDGs, or urgency disposition groups, that apply in smaller emergency services where the diagnosis isn't collected. And for NEP 14, we're using version 1.3. And the, uh, the, I guess the more complex classification system that applies in the vast majority of emergency departments is the URGs, or urgency related groups. So this includes diagnosis as a, an extra splitting variable. Uh, in 2013, we undertook a major review of the emergency classification. Uh, and that was uh, done for us by health policy analysis and um, that's available on our website, as all our reports are, so if you're interested in the, in the detail of that, I encourage you to have a look. Uh, it found a number of things. First, and probably most important for us, was that there wasn't any suitable international alternatives identified, so it would have been great that we, if we had been able to find one that was in use and, uh, and would meet the conditions that, uh, for use in Australia, and we could have adapted, but we can't. 
Um, it identified opportunities for some significant improvement in the URG and UDG system. Um, we got a lot of feedback from uh, clinicians, particularly around uh, the reluctance um, uh, to see triage used as a, a splitting variable in the classification system. Uh, the feedback being, of course, that it wasn't designed as a classification tool, it, it's used for different things. Uh, and it recommended restructuring the classification scheme. Um, and so the, the recommended, recommended classification uh, scheme is, is here, so it, it starts to split on type of visit, so there's, there's lots of different types of visits that occur in, uh, in EDs. Uh, and then using diagnosis as the second split, and then uh, starting to build some complexity measures, uh, it, which in the short term are likely to um, include age, disposition and triage, but in the longer term really moving to more, uh, more sophisticated measures of complexity. Uh, so we are starting that work uh, now. Uh, one of the other key recommendations was uh, to, to build a common list of uh, diagnosis codes for the ED um, so that we've got uh, a more consistent capture uh, of diagnosis uh, across the country. And that work's commenced uh, already and there'll be more work on the ED classification over the coming 12 months. Uh, for non-admitted services, we're using uh, Tier 2, which I'm sure many of you uh, know and love, like we do at IPA. Um, it's a clinic-based uh, classification, so it's not patient-centric. And this is a very good example of a classification where we, uh, there was a trade-off between administrative ease and, and the ability to implement it uh, in the timeframes of the uh, health reform agreement um, with data burden and explanatory power. So. Uh, it's suitable for both patient level data where it's available, but we know that the not admitted data capture around Australia is uh, challenging. Uh, there's uh, all the jurisdictions doing a lot of work on it, but uh, that uh, many jurisdictions don't have good patient level uh, data available yet. Um, so it works on aggregate data as well. Uh, we've done a lot of work this year to um, develop and enhance the system. So we have clearer definitions in the definition manual. We have much better supporting documentation. Uh, we have the compendium, which I'm sure many of you have seen, that has uh, examples of how the classification should be applied. Uh, and we get regular feedback from people on, on new clinics we should consider for inclusion, and we'll be doing that again uh, this year. We also did an extensive review of um, non-admitted classification uh, in 2013. PwC undertook that work for us. And again, that will be available on our website shortly if you're interested in the detail. Uh, it found that uh, tier two is uh, not suitable in the long term um, for ABF. It found that there's no suitable international system available. We, we had thought uh, at times there were some that looked uh, really feasible, but when you go in, into deeper detail, uh, the conditions where they were applied were uh, significantly different to how uh, non-admitted services in Australia operate. Um, and that we need to develop a new classification system. And that this should be patient-centric, so it will require patient-level data. It's likely that it will require um, some diagnosis information, so that's a significant change to how non-admitted data is collected in Australia. Uh, and could possibly require procedure data over time. So. We're talking about a significant change to uh, how non-admitted uh, patient data is collected and, and acknowledges that this will require significant investment uh, by jurisdictions. So uh, IPA's um, got a work plan on this. Uh, we intend to commence on this soon, but will require commitment from uh, jurisdictions as we go forward. Uh, one of the key pieces of work, and Alistair referred to this earlier, is uh, teaching, training and research. Uh, so there's currently um, no classification system available for teaching, training and research um, in public hospitals. Uh, and these services are currently block funded uh, under the uh, IPA's uh, price determinations. But under the National Health Reform Agreement, we're required to provide advice to the COAG Health Council on the feasibility of moving to ABF, um, and we need to give that advice by 2018. And so we've had significant work underway in this area. 
Uh, we've determined definitions, which uh, Alistair had up before, and they're on our website. Um, and if you want to have a look at them, they're there. They've been approved by the Pricing Authority. Uh, we've undertaken an extensive uh, cost driver analysis. We've had Paxton Partners uh, have undertaken that work for us. Uh, we think the cost drivers for teaching and training uh, are fairly well substantiated. We could see clear drivers uh, in the data we had available. And the primary driver is really the volume and mix of uh, students or trainees uh, in hospitals. Uh, cost drivers for research uh, was more difficult. Uh, we couldn't find uh, clear drivers. Uh, it was hampered by data quality. We had a very limited uh, data set uh, available in the time we had to do the work. Uh, and IPA's uh, undertaking a lot more work on this with a small group. We've got a, a small group of the jurisdictions and some uh, peak bodies in research who are advising us on this work. Uh, and there'll be a decision point at some stage or the advice we provide to uh, the COAG Health Council at some stage on is this feasible and does it make sense uh, given the quantum of funding that's spent on research by states and territories. So we think this is um, uh, likely uh, how the classification for teaching and training will, will end up. Um, so splits along professional lines, uh, sub-splits on discipline, and uh, splits on the stage of training. So from the data we had, uh, these were sort of the explanatory uh, variables. Um, there's some debate over where the phase of uh, teaching will sit, uh, either at the end or at the beginning. Uh, and so that will be supported, the next stage of classification will be supported by a, a costing study that we expect uh, to run in, the, in 2015. Uh, so as I said, we're doing a, a detailed review of the feasibility of funding research on an activity basis. Um, we've got a costing study currently scheduled for teaching and training in 2015. Uh, we expect, uh, if that goes to plan, that we would commence uh, the development of a classification system in the second half of 2015 and provide advice to the COAG Health Council. And the last big area is, uh, is mental health. So currently, IPA uses uh, DRGs to price admitted mental health patients. Um, we have a modified approach to how we set those prices. Uh, we set the in liar boundaries using a modified approach, uh, which gives the, the classification actually a really good performance. Uh, it performs comparable to all the other DRGs uh, taking that approach. Uh, Non-admitted mental health services are, are block funded uh, under current arrangements. And the pricing authority has determined that a new classifications um, required for mental health. So we know that uh, diagnosis isn't a good predictor of cost for these services. And we're, we're very keen to make sure that the new classification supports uh, the model of care. So we're really focused on making sure that it has integration across settings uh, and supports how these services are delivered. So the key steps to developing a new classification won't be news to many of you, but uh, it's about defining the services that are in scope, uh, identifying the cost drivers, undertaking a costing study and then doing the classification development, uh, testing that and then uh, collecting the data required to price services. So there's steps we're going through for mental health. Uh, so step one, uh, defining the services. So we commissioned the University of Queensland to lead a, a project uh, that both defined uh, services that would be in scope for the classification and determined the cost drivers for those services uh, in 2012. Uh, the definition that's been approved by uh, the pricing authority is up there. I'm not going to step through uh, each part, um, but the, the key parts uh, are the, the second, uh, these two points here. Um, so it's delivered under the management of or regularly informed by a clinician with specialised expertise in mental health and is evidenced by a formal mental health uh, assessment and implementation of a documented uh, mental health plan. Uh, the University of Queensland project uh, then went through a, uh, a very extensive uh, data analysis to identify the cost drivers and this then informs uh, the data we need to collect in a costing study. 
And based on that data and based on the uh, very extensive literature survey they undertook, uh, they proposed that uh, three additional um, data elements need to be collected. Uh, the first one is the phase of care. So this is the clinician's judgment of the uh, prospective goal of the care that's being uh, delivered. Um, the literature shows that the first episode of psychosis is a significant driver of cost and uh, that uh, recording the interventions um, delivered is also important. So that full report uh, is available on our website. Uh, it's a very dense report. There's uh, all the detail there and all the analysis. So if people are interested, it is all there to see. So the UQ report also found that uh, much of the data was um, uh, of poor quality, particularly this is in relation to cost, uh, cost data, and that the variables that they'd identified as being cost drivers uh, were either not uh, complete or not being collected uh, at the moment, and recommended that a uh, costing study be undertaken uh, to progress the development of a classification. And, and that's what we're doing. So we've commissioned a consortium uh, led by Health Consult uh, to undertake a six-month prospective costing study, which commences on the 1st of July this year. Uh, we have around 25 uh, sites participating, which covers public hospitals, community mental health services, <clears throat> and also private hospitals. Uh, and this will run for six months and include the collection of the additional data items uh, as well as cost information. And that data then will feed into the classification development, which will commence uh, later this year with the planning work. Uh, it will be undertaken by IPA, uh, and we'll seek advice from uh, our mental health working group. So we have a large advisory group uh, made up of clinicians, uh, representatives of carers and consumers, and all the jurisdictions who are advising us. Uh, and we'll also seek input from other classification experts. Uh, we expect to complete that work in the first half of 2015, uh, with trials in the second half of 2015, and our uh, stated target date for pricing is 1 July 16. <clears throat> 